Okay, welcome once again to the Mastering the Game of Allyship podcast. I am your host, Wendell, and I guess also the creator of the Mastering the Game of Allyship program, along with Mastering the Game of Life. We are here to make making big changes, big, hard, transformative changes in the world fun through embodied creative play. Today, I have my dear friend, Micah McCrary-Dennis, who is the founder of mentor mentorship 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 which mentorship is a, in the scholarship program a program i tell people uh at least that it's the interaction iteration that i came into it the elevator pitch was pokemon go for scholarships the idea that like you could go out and if you're seeking as a student um scholarships for school there is an app that you could go to that would list all of them in a fun, engaging way that was developmentally informed and could pair you to scholarship creators, the mentors of the mentorship, um, and allow people to sort of create micro scholarships for these really important goals that they think that like kids, scholarship seekers should be having. And so kind of decentralizing the experience of creating scholarships. Well, you know, also including the big guys, but really creating a platform that makes scholarships Again, fun, easy, gamified. So when I heard about you, oh my God, has it been a year? You're in some change now? Um, I was blown away just because as far as people like living the principles of gamified transformation, I mean, you yoked mentorship and I'll let you talk more about this to like the 17 sustainability uh, UN goals, United Nations goals. And I was just like, great. You got the big vision. You got the specific product and a heart for um your people who you're trying to help. And that for me is like the definition of um, an effective ally. So I just wanted to like chat with you, chat with my, have you sort of speak to sort of my audience just so they can have a more tangible example of like, here's how how big this can go. It's not necessarily just you hanging out, um, doing bake sales at your church, which is totally fine, not knocking that. Um, and there's even an opportunity for you in your effective allyship to partner with mentorship as maybe a mentor or the scholarship giver. So. Uh, Micah, the first question I have for you is, what was the turning point? What was the the moment where you were like, oh, no, like, I've got to make this happen? Um, I think the turning point was when I realized I wasn't completely satisfied and happy in my uh, job role as an engineer, uh, working with Intel and, and semiconductors. Um, I wanted always to become an engineer to help people directly. Uh, I'm, oh, I love working with machines and devices and things and being able, to how to, being able to learn how to disassemble and reassemble and make them more effective or productive. Uh, but at the same time, I like doing that for people who are directly influenced by said machine device or product. Uh, but at Intel, I wasn't really satisfied because I was pushing buttons on machines that didn't affect people directly. It affected the next uh, process in the assembly line and I realized that if I truly want to affect the type of social change in the world that I see wanting and needing to happen, uh, I needed to bring mentorship to life uh, sooner rather than later. And so I said, well, what kind of problems was I having, not just with scholarships, but with the whole mentoring aspect of mm. finding the right career that would fit my passion? Uh, and I didn't, I had several mentors, but every, all of my mentors were always guiding me towards the, <laughs> the stereotypical dream of, okay, you go to college, you get a good job, you get a high paying job, and then you go work there for 25 years and then you can retire, you know, <laughs> um, but it wasn't along, well, Michael, what do you want to really do? And how can I help you get to that dream job role where you can be fully satisfied uh, with that? And so that's where the combination of mentorships and scholarships came in because as I uh, reflected, I realized that one of the other hardships besides just the job role that I was in uh, was that I was paying for classes that I took years and a decade ago, uh, paying off certain student loans, and I still wasn't being fulfilled in the, in the engineering role that I, I wound up in and that I chose essentially. Uh, and so mentoring and mentorship was twofold. One, it was having a mentor who could better guide a student towards a career path that they can truly be fulfilled in and find passion in. Um, and then two, it was making sure they could achieve that goal 
debt free. So being able to maximize any scholarship opportunities that they had. Um, and when thinking about scholarships in general, I reflected back again, I was like, okay, well, what was I doing in my junior and senior year in high school to not get as many scholarships as I could have in order to completely cover all the total costs of attending college uh, at Florida A&M University. And that scholarship piece was just, it was convoluted. It was hard to find. And even 15, almost 20 years ago, um, when the internet was still kind of new and novel, there were search engines that could help match you with scholarships, but everything was just, well, here's a list of scholarships that match your profile. All you've got to do is select one and apply to it and select the next one, apply to it. But again, there was no mentoring. There was no guidance. There was no certainty or probability statistics that said, you know, you've got a really good shot at getting this, this scholarship mm -hmm. or, you know, all you got to do is better craft your, your passion and your, in your statement and your essay to get this scholarship. And the um, only thing that it made you better at was applying for more scholarships, <laughs> like the skill of applying for scholarships got you money, but the act of doing it didn't necessarily also enrich you. Exactly. And so mentorship came out of that idea. And the reason I had to do it right then and there was because I look back 2004, student loan deficit was around $400 billion when I started college and, and finished high school and started college. Um, and then after I got out of college, graduated master's and PhD um, and started my job role, I look back at that same research and it was like, okay, we've gone up to $1.7 trillion in student loan deficit. So students are not really applying to scholarships. There's billions of dollars of scholarship money being left on the table just because students don't know how to apply to it. They aren't being made aware of those scholarships. Mm -hmm. They find it difficult and demotivating to apply to scholarships in that traditional sense. Um, and so we had to do something that would transform the way students felt about scholarships, mm -hmm. felt about being motivated about applying to scholarships and how they felt about what scholarships are and how they could impact their future. Well, and it so, also sounds like you brought your engineering brain to it, that, that that was the thing that like sort of split that difference of like, okay, this process needs to be transformed. It needs to break sort of the, I'll use a gaming metaphor, like there's the railroad games where it's like, okay, you get on a rail and then you kind of get sent through the plot. You sort of saw the need for people being able to sort of go on their own journey and find kind of what's happening. And then knowing that, kind of hero's journey style in the forest like you always need the mentor you need the obi-wan you need someone who's like okay if you're gonna go broad to find something that's totally connected to you you're gonna need to find a person who's also connected to you that's been in the forest that does the thing and you found a way to like take this like seemingly inner process and also add a structure to it so that people can sort of participate with it but it still is kicking out more consistent results All right yep and uh, I mean, that's why I had to go ahead and start it when I did, because the student loan deficit, uh, when I started the company uh, or had the idea and the concept and kind of initialized the, the design and development of the company, uh, $1.7 trillion. And today, four years later, uh, we're rapidly approaching $2 trillion in student loan debt. And even though the government is talking about debt forgiveness and debt relief programs, uh, that affects students who've already been through the process, but there are still new students that are getting ready to go through the same process and through which 15, 20 years down the road, there's going to have to be a new debt relief debt uh, forgiveness policy or program that the both sides of the red and blue are going to be like, no, we should help. And then the other sides are going to be like, no, we shouldn't help students. And everybody's still going to be having this debate instead of saying, well, why don't we just motivate students to go after these scholarship opportunities? Why don't we just put more money and more opportunities in the space for students to discover so that we don't have to deal with this student loan deficit in 10, 15, 20 years? I mean, that's, so that's what really jump started it. That's the question that I have. Two questions emerge from that. The first is who is most impacted by this 1.5, almost $2 trillion? I'll speak to myself because, again, we're both Black men. I was so happy and so benefited from going to college. It was great. It was the easiest path for me. But like when I look back on it, like I wouldn't have gone if I wasn't being sort of pressured to go. I know there's tons of people more like me who didn't have parents who pushed them, who they could look at that $1.5 billion and go, hell no, <laughs> I'm, not do I'm not doing that. That sounds like a, a tremendous scam. Um, and so there's, it sounds like there's people being left out of the process just from the very obvious problem of the entire game. Like there's folk who are bought in enough that they'll take the debt or they'll even play the game a little bit. But it sounds like some of the major impacts are having from people who aren't even 
joining the game because they've already been pushed aside because they see it like doesn't work. Right. As we simultaneously sip on our water tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> that, 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 I think that answers that, that, that first question, just kind of what made me want to start it right then and there. Um, and since then, I've just been passionately, diligently every day working towards meeting the goals that we've set for ourselves. Uh, back in 2017 was the concept. 2018 was kind of the formation of the idea. 2019, we formed our nonprofit uh, 501c3. And the last three years have been geared towards how do we truly make this an experience that students will want to engage in? And so we brought in aspects and features like using augmented reality and virtual reality, uh, because that's where students are. That's where they're living in these uh, metaverse type worlds right now. And that's what they understand. And they want to figure out, well, how does their learnings in these metaverse or gamified experiences translate into the real world? And there are not very many games or applications that do that outside of kind of strict educational technology, let's train you under this particular subject matter on this particular um, topic of focus within this subject. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, kind of really understanding financial literacy, uh, when it comes to educational pursuits, and understanding what you want to pursue, that will benefit you and return an income after you finish your degrees or certification. We at Mentorship have to, and want to, and have been making our app engageable for students, making it fun and exciting for students, making it a truly interesting experience that they will gain interest from and both financially and motivationally and guide them down a more certain path before they even step foot on the college campus. They're not gonna say, okay, I'm gonna take out these student loans and then I'm gonna be a general education student until I figure out what I wanna do. Or if I don't figure out what I wanna do, then I'll just stop going to school or I may graduate with a general ed degree. Uh, but I still, after I graduate and have paid all this money through these student loans and have to pay this back at some point, I still don't really have a purpose. And like I was saying before, when I was at Intel, I followed my passion in engineering. I followed what I felt was my purpose for my purpose-driven life, uh, as the book is quoted. Um, but I wasn't fully satisfied. And so mm -hmm. I don't want the future generations of students to have that demotivation, dissatisfied feeling after they've gone through X amount of years of school, after they spent X amount of dollars on school, only to come to say, this isn't really what I wanted to do. I wanted to be on this path, but slightly tangent off to the left, or I wanted to be going completely something totally different, you know? Um, and so that's mentorship. Mentorship where mentors chip in, reward students in the local communities for just pursuing their passion, following uh, a path that will lead them towards a prosperous future, thereby better enabling them to come back into their home communities and impact that community positively going forward. Ooh, that's amazing. The whole damn sermon. So this is the part of the show. Again, I like I like sort of digging in because of course there's always different phases. Like I, I talk about the um stages of effective allyship. Um stages? Stages versus steps. So the st stages is wake up, clean up, grow up, show up. And so when I hear this story, like your waking up moment was the, your own experience. Like you had a wake up moment at Intel where you were like became aware of like, man, this experience. It's kind of demoralizing. This is kind. Of, this kind of like sucks. Like I did everything right, and I've got this different experience that I wanted. And there was this desire to sort of help, uh, maybe an imagined version of like younger Micah, but all the other younger Micahs that sort of exists in the world. What I'm curious about is, and this is where my job as a shadow worker, as an embodied play person, come in, is that cleanup steps. Like, what barriers did you have to overcome? sort of emotionally within yourself to start taking those steps after you became aware that you want to sort of shift, like what were like the inner journeys? If you're mentoring someone who's gonna then go on and start a uh, do-gooder 5013C product-driven uh, way to help people, what type of um, inner shifts did you have to go through to even get to this point, to even stay on the path this long? Hmm. Number one, it, again, that self-reflection was the first one. Is this something that I feel I can do? Uh, and I had to overcome the self-doubt, the imposter syndrome, the, the own, my own internal demotivation where I was like, ah, 
somebody's probably already done it. Somebody could probably do it better. Uh, I'm probably not the best fit for, for this process improvement, even though that is my background in engineering. I am a process engineer, process improvement, quality insurance, and that's what we're trying to bring to this scholarship process. But I felt like I might not be the one. Then luckily, again, what you asked me before, what I'm grateful for is my friends. One of those things was my friends because I sat down with my homeboy from elementary, middle school, high school back home. And we're sitting in my mom's driveway one morning, uh, afternoon, evening. I don't remember. I think it's probably closer to evening time. Um, and he was like, Mike, if this, if working in Intel is not what you want to do, then what do you want to do? I was like, bro, I don't really know what I want to do, but I know I want to help people. I want to impact those who are seeking to get somewhere that I've already kind of been and journeyed through and see how I can impact those. And he's like, well, what does that look like? I said, I have no idea, but I've always been curious about app development. Uh, since I was in uh, early college and phones and smartphones were starting to kind of really pop off with these apps, I, I would think about different apps that I could create. And I was like, ah, is that really something that we really need is another app that does this or another non-consequential game app? No, is there an app that can truly provide someone with reassurance that they can do something, that they can achieve something, that they can use what they have, the skills that they learn to get to the next level and stage and phase of where they want to be. Um, and so that was one, coming over, overcoming my own self-doubt. Uh, number two was, how do I do this? Like, how do I start a company? How do I run a company? Who's going to help me do this? And at the very beginning, I mean, I'm wearing all the hats, every single hat that could be worn. That was me. Right. And after a while, it was getting like burnt out and get back to whole defeated. Like, can I do this? Should I do this? Am I the right one to do this? Uh, and then I would meet friends again and our new new acquaintances that would later become friends. They're like, yo, that is a great idea. You know, I let me know when this is going to be ready because I've got kids, I've got students, I'm part of this community organization who has kids and students who, are, who need something like this. And that's what gave me that spark. I said, okay, all right, let's keep going. I haven't found anything on Google. I submitted a patent application. Nobody's really done anything in this space like this before. Um, and so maybe I am the one to do it. And then I, it was the third part was, all right, Mike, if, if you can overcome your self-doubt and if you can believe that you are the one to do it, then why is right now the time to do it? Hmm. And besides that 1.7 to $2 trillion rising student loan deficit, the right now was, well, let's go back into your inventions and idea book. Now let's see which of these things that you thought of already exist or are just now coming to market. And you wrote something down about it five or 10 years ago. And suddenly I see this product or this uh, device or something. I was like, I go to my book, man, I, I designed this already. Oh, I could have been having this product out to market, helping serve customers or people in this way. Uh, and so now I'm not going to let anybody else take this idea and run with it themselves and, and do something that I know that I could have done because I had that great idea, mm. but it's not just the idea, it's about the execution. So back to that execution and step-by-step, step, uh, step one was starting a business. Step two was finding teammates and crew members to help drive the vision and missions forward. And step three was making sure that we could be consistent in how we were running and operating the nonprofit. And so yep. here we are. That's amazing because you just accidentally outlined every step of the effective allyship process. So if there's the stages, the wake up, clean up, grow up, show up, we're still going to go back to the, the growing up and showing up. The steps are find your allyship superpower, process and improvement engineer, and also visionary. You, could, you had two superpowers and one of them was obvious and one of them kind of emerged. The obvious one was just like, this is the thing that I'm trained on. I'm making the big bucks doing the thing. But the other one is just like you looking back and being like, yo, I keep coming up with these ideas that keep coming to market. Clearly, I'm on to something. I just have to sort of believe in myself. So your cleanup practice kind of was overcoming the fact that like you did have the vision and you were top tier at it and your embodied like skill of being like dope. Great. The second one, overcoming, you know, your your obstacles to like finding out who basically finding out who you can help and that was sort of built into like your superpowers like yo after deciding you wanted to help someone you immediately decided okay i want to help someone who's like me in the past that's the cheat code if anyone at home is listening like you can always help yourself five years ago ten years ago downside is you got to like them <laughs> you got to be like that person that you were that years ago otherwise you won't uh you won't be as effective at helping them you find out who who that is and again sort of the people on the scholarship 
train like you were. Stage three is finding people to help you help them. And you outlined it exactly perfectly where you said the friends that came in that gave you the inspiration or even the motivation to keep going, but then literally pulling the team together to be like, yo, I can't make this happen if I'm getting burnt out. So many ineffective allies do every step except the thing that gets in the way, which is the burnout. So many visionary folk, their cleanup phase really is solving for that burnout, like that they you know, might have come up in organizations that structurally didn't let them burn out. Like, you know, companies aren't necessarily going to be doing full on wellness things, but they have to always not work you so hard that you start quitting. So that time kind of ends up getting built into your environment until you step away from that. And suddenly now you're responsible for your own burnout. As an ally, we're all responsible for our own sustainability and being able to move into receiving help, receiving support from friends quickly is dope. I mean, again, I'm cheating a little bit. Most structures, this podcast is really here to like prove and show that over time and time again, anyone who succeeded at anything in the allyship space, the skilled helping space, will go through these steps or reveal themselves as like a crazy superpower. John Henry just like, yeah, I just kind of kept knocking the rails into the thing by myself. It was cool. I'm like, this man's a superhero. Most people still end up getting a support group. And just like you said, showing up consistently is that last bit. So that's the full steps. Like if anyone wants to be a good ally, just follow those steps, find out your superpower, find out who your superpower can help. I always use the metaphor. Superman is only super on earth and earth sun. He's just some guy in Krypton without that. So like you can shift your superpower just by context. One of the easiest ways to do it, especially for people who end up helping kids. Kids are small. If you're just a big dude next to a kid, you're super now. You can actually help people just by being in the right context where you have power. And then again, building a strong support group like this is a luxury where a lot of people end up failing is that we don't necessarily build friendships that are empowering like that I would say like you and me Micah we're, like, we're pretty blessed of having friends that are like supportive in that way but a lot of people's allyship journeys live or die on the ability to draw the people in that are going to like support them because everyone's friendships usually supported the life they had before they decided to become an ally and so suddenly being an ally makes them like a threat to their friendship structures. And that's such a key part that it's important. But I want to talk about the grow up phase. So we got the cleanup phase. You had to overcome some of these like limiting beliefs. You had to overcome the ability that you could do everything yourself. This shadow that sort of pops up and I do a lot of work with that. But the grow up phase is really what levels of development, what skills did you develop or what new perspectives just about how the world works kind of emerged as you're becoming a more effective ally. Um, the grow up phase is really how did you start inhabiting power? Like if you're going to be an effective ally at level one, the idea is that at level five, you're going to be, you know, five times as effective an ally. And that a lot of staying on the path is the ability to bring more power to yourself. Sometimes you do that just by like, again, enrolling friends. But a lot of times you do that just by like your own research, your own education, learning things. Like what did you learn less experientially on the path but more like uh, just intellectually about the nature of, this work and and why other people should like sort of come into it and how you can be like an effective lever against some of these like you know big forces that are, are kind of keeping folk down was that rhetorical that's not rhetorical i'm curious okay. i don't know all right okay um some of the intellectual lessons that i've learned are let's see You know, ask me the question one more time. And, and Ooh, it, was, it was three questions in there and they're all trying to be answered at the exact same time. So <laughs> Perfect. Of course, number one. If I'm working with the process engineer, I gotta, I gotta do it step by step. So here, I'm gonna actually reframe it. How have you grown since starting on the path? Like, so there's like ah. the beliefs that you shifted, but like, how did you like actually improve your skills on the path? I think one of the biggest skill improvements was setting aside my academic learning skills mm -hmm. and meeting more with real people in this industry and in business in general to learn how the world really operates. I mean, as we know, we go through college thinking that it's going to teach us everything when in fact college is just an introductory lesson in most of these books that we're 
we're we're required that are required as part of the text or part of the courses or the outline. Um, and so being able to understand, okay, this is the way you think when you're in school. This is how the academic training works. It says, read this, recite, recall this, take a test, pass the test, move on. But in this business and in this operation, it's read this, recall this. Do you remember this? Go back and read it again. Because you may have missed something, move forward. Once you move forward, say, okay, I've got this step here and we're moving into this space. We're moving with this step. And suddenly you're like, wait a minute, something's missing here. So you got to go back again and, and re read again. And then, okay, did I do I recall what I just read as it applies to the phase that I'm at now? And at each phase that you go to, it's almost like you have to go backwards just to keep moving forward. Yeah. Um, versus again, in school, once you're done with Calc 1, you're moving on to Calc 2. Yes, there's some fundamentals that you may have to go back and review, but your goal is to get through this test, get through this homework, get through this quiz, get through this assignment, so you can move on and on and on, graduate, get your degree, and then figure out, oh, okay, I'm in my job now. Do I actually need these skills that I learned in Cal 1, Cal 2, Cal 3? No. Or yes, you know, um, and if you learned it then, do you still know it? Can you recall it? If not, you've got to go back and review it because now you're in the real world. And so that real world versus that academic world and the growing up in that transitionary phase is kind of where I actually still am mm. and probably won't leave. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if there is uh, another spot on top of that, but that's a big shift. I do know I see a lot of allies, they come in and again, they want the formula. So I made the formula, but one of the big developmental shifts that happens uh, in some of the work that I do is between, for any of you that care about spiral dynamics, great. If you don't, this might not make any sense. Who cares? It's my podcast. <laughs> but there's a developmental level called orange. It's the science level. It's the level that pretty much invents our concept of academia. Business starts emerging there for the first time. It loves formulas. It loves outside in knowledge where it says okay we're going to treat everything as objects we're going to break it down into like it's chunks and then you should be able to apply science to it to get a result everything is very linear input output input output and again school teaches us to kind of do things this way um even jobs like the reason why there's certain jobs where you actually can pretty successfully make the transition from school to the jobs because the jobs are built usually paying for the school to teach the people to do the thing yada 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 so that ends up being fine the second you leave that again to be an entrepreneur and I think that every effective ally is at some aspect an entrepreneur in the sense that they're seeking out problems to solve that haven't been solved you're always going to have that visionary entrepreneur aspect when you decide that you want to be a skilled helper what I'm hearing in your story and again it even connects to the nature of your product is that things start being instead of a vertical uh, learning experience, it becomes an exploration experience. It's like, okay, there might be a center of knowledge that you have that you're constantly returning to, but the applications are happening on the margins. They're happening at the edge of where you're like growing. You're like, okay, if the business is heading this way, but my resources are back here, suddenly now I'm going to have an almost intellectual supply chain <laughs> inside my head of like, we got to maintain that supply chain. Otherwise we won't remember stuff and we might have to go all the way back to do that. And so that sort of moves the, the game into more of a horizontal experience, even like building connections as a way to start helping people versus learning skills. It's like, well, if you mean enough connections with enough people who already have the skills, you don't got to learn shit. You just go talk right. to the person who already has like the knowledge. And, and that was a big transition for me too. So I, I like hearing that because I also see that you taking that knowledge, that growing up, that's part of the structure of mentorship is that you're going to students before they even get in the roller coaster ride of college and being like, yo, the actual benefit is going to be how do you horizontally connect with people who have skills? How do you start learning those meta skills of like relating to people? How do you take responsibility on you making like your own money, even to pay for the school ahead of time? I met um, some of my favorite people in college were non-traditional students because they already knew the value of their investment. They'd been out in the world. And then they decided to go to college where me rolling at 18, like I still didn't know my brain wasn't done yet. I was just mm -hmm. doing the next thing because people sort of told me and it wasn't until after college that, like you said, I had that same disillusionment experience. And that lesson ended up being kind of a bonk in the head as opposed to, again, an experience that I could choose that I could say, hey, I'm going to on purpose at 18, take responsibility for my experience and yay me, 
I'm going to use an experience that seems like it reflects my needs in the real time. And I think you're, you're totally spot on engaging technologically focused uh, metaverse style things are meeting people where they're at and also giving them the new bit of information that they might not have, the new insight that they don't have, which is relationship and small gains over time is how you get there. Most people in their scholarship are like aiming for that one big whale but that's not a strategy that works in business. You don't go for the one big whale. And you know, I'm going to make you <laughs> talk about this next because it's a very important part of your story. You don't go for the one big whale. You're always hustling. You're always hitting the different connections. And it's since the game you're playing all the time, there is a benefit to making it fun, a structural benefit to making it fun because if that game is exhausting, you're not going to make it. And so you're meeting this very like multi-tiered need of like, here are the students here's where they're at, here's what they care about. I always tell people, you gotta be more engaging than Netflix and the couch these days. Whatever you're building, it's gotta be better than Netflix and the couch or Fortnite. If you don't, chill, you're gonna need to use outside forces to force people to do that thing, but that means they're also gonna always be forced into it. And you've built something that I think really includes all that stuff. But I'm curious about your whale story. <laughs> your okay. particular aiming for the fence, like if we get this one thing, all our problems will be solved. I happen to know that you have one. I, I I will sometimes insinuate it for people, but I know you enough that I was like, I know your, your whale story. This is the Niantic story. You got to tell people this <laughs> transformation. Well, kind of like you mentioned at the beginning, the the kind of foray into mentorship that I would often lead with for, for easy understanding for people is that, you know, what we're developing in mentorship is like the Pokemon Go experience, but for scholarship, students can use augmented reality to discover opportunities in their own community instead of going after these little creatures that uh, don't really bring value to your real world, maybe your metaphysical or psychological world, but not to your income or to your actual skills that you can apply elsewhere in the world. Let's put some scholarships there, advertise them in the same way, and it essentially becomes an advertising source uh, that uses augmented reality to engage those students in that awareness. And so as I was building up mentorship in the concept originally, and I, I started comparing to that Pokemon Go game that was, be, that was very popular five, six years ago, um, I said, yeah, this is what kids are going after, this augmented virtual metaverse kind of experience that overlays a, a superficial world into their real world surroundings. And so I said, you know what? If we get this to a state where we can pitch to Niantic, the developers of Pokemon Go, they will instantly, and I mean so instantly, see the value in what we're building that they will want to just give us money, like to make sure it comes to fruition. And when we finally got that opportunity to pitch to Niantic, they came back with a first rejection. And then a year later, they came back with a second rejection, basically saying, we don't think this should be a gamified experience. We think that you're making it this process that you're trying to improve too complex uh, by trying to add this gamified layer to it. Uh, and so that was the probably the most disheartening letdown of my mentorship, entrepreneurship, startup and development career. Uh, that being the people that definitely, I expect you definitely should be able to connect with this vision, mission, values, purpose, and social impact, did not believe in that, either mm -hmm. did not believe that it was possible, did not believe it was feasible, did not believe that the way we were presenting it was the best way to do it, and so that was the hard hit rejection twice, and honestly, I'm going to submit it back to them again. <laughs> the, more, <laughs> the more we we develop, the more lessons we learn, like I said, going forward, only to take a couple steps back before we move forward again, I took their criticism and I took it to heart. I said, this isn't rejection, this is redirection. And though they may have a problem with the particular gamified aspects that I was presenting, maybe there is still a holistic perspective of a pseudo gamified nature to mentorship and scholarships that they will be able, better to, able to understand. Uh, and so this last year, even after this last rejection back in February and March, We've just turned that into redirection. We said, oh, they had a problem with the financial aspect and component of that being included in an app. Pool, let's pull that out. Instead of having digital wallets right now at this forefront, let's just make it something physical, something that's tangible, that's easily recognizable. So let's make scholarship gift cards. Boom, partner with a gift card company. Now we've got scholarship gift cards that we can readily manufacture and distribute to students individually. Uh, and then the second part was, okay, well, we're trying to do maybe too much gamification? How can we just simplify 
the gamify experience that we're trying to bring to students. Well, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get them to accumulate and collect something. Well, there's a game right there just in collecting. People turn many types of things into just collecting. It's not a play game, but it's a inherent game of sorts. I, I'm not sure how to better describe that except maybe um, trading cards example, you know, not a game, but there's a group and community of people who understand the value in what you all have in common and what you all have to share. And so I say, okay, well, we already were going down a scholarship summary card right, uh, route in order to present students with a more digestible summary of that scholarship. Well, maybe we can turn these into trading card style uh, uh, gamified experience. So now students are peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Now, oh, I just found this scholarship summary card. I apply to it and I'm gonna pass it on to my friend and they're gonna pass it on to their friend. And that becomes a, a simplified, gamified way to, to explore scholarships. But again, that hitting that Niantic wall twice and hitting those rejection points, it, and I'll go back to say, <laughs> my friend and I used to go to Six Flags over Georgia and mm. we play what was called the rejection game. And the rejection game was very simple. The goal of the game was to find as many uh, counterparts that we wanted to <laughs> spend the day with and go around hot parks girls. and ride on rides. You're trying to find hot girls. <laughs> ride on rides with and maybe get the number at the end of the day and then call on the telephone and meet up at Six Flags the next weekend or go to the movies, go to the roller skating rink. But the goal of the rejection game was not to approach a counterpart and say, the the most grandiose things to get them to buy into you so that you you sell them on lies but really just present yourself be authentic and if they reject you cool you get a point for that mm -hmm. because eventually you're going to get to the ones that say yes that equals zero points but your your excitement is yep. through the roof once those seven to ten digits get on that piece of paper you're like Hey, y'all won the game, but I won in life. Like y'all got rejected all these times, sir. We we tally y'all up, get get you twenty five cent or a dollar for every rejection. But I got the number. I'm gonna get to follow up with what could possibly come next, and then that opens up a whole future perspective of possibilities. Uh, but it was still, hey, let's just play the game, put ourselves out there, get rejected. So what? Move on to the next one. Move on to the next opportunity. Move on to the next idea. Move on to the next stage. Uh, and so bringing that into mentorship was also its early concept. Like how many students can we inspire to just go and get rejected from scholarships? And could we possibly pay them just to apply even if they get rejected later? You know, That was one of my favorite features because that is such a transformative shift. Like this is the base, I mean, I'll pull, I got these books next to me all the time. Jay McGonigal and her reality is broken and super better talks about the fact that just like one of the fundaments of certain types of game design is that most games you're in a fail state the entire time you're playing like yep. you, until you are the pokemon master you are losing you technically haven't won games are codified by the fact that you're having an engaging pleasant experience while losing work is the exact opposite you are losing and you hate it and maybe they'll give you a couple bucks and so making that shift is so huge, so important. And what I sort of see in your growing up mode, because this this is the shift, I'm just reflecting it, you know, uh, connecting with people, connecting with people in like your community, your peers, the rejection game has like affected you. You're still playing that game. That's something you learned early on and you're still playing it. As you grow bigger as an effective ally, as an effective change maker, you're starting to see the edge of what is considered to be a big swing or not like the first time that Niantic rejected you is probably like big second time was disheartening but I haven't even seen it because you brought basically we you bring me in and we start talking after the second one I saw you sort of get better where even as you tell them we're going to apply again I'm like well, that's a different energy now Niantic style swings are your normal you've actually for that to become your normal most people would be like oh I just got used to it. it's like no you literally have to get bigger so that that experience is now smaller and so when we talk about growing up it is the experience of bigness of power through experience and I love that story just because again I was partly a participant I'm in like the background being like yo okay what's going on what's happening but also it happens every time and it's the thing I always want to tell every allies I mean they talk about it in tech companies where it's like it's always your second project that ends up getting big 
And so the quickest way to get big is to fail at your first thing as well as possible. Here's the trick, though. We got a lot of people failing fast just to get out of the way, but you still have to fail well. It can't just be a yeah. toss something out. It's got to be something you cared about. It's got to be something you put all your heart into, and it's overcoming that failure that allows you to have the bravery to keep moving forward. And if you can gamify that experience, that's how I've seen most of the most effective allies keep going, because the most effective allies are the ones who don't stop playing the game the ones who stay exactly. in the game they keep helping people mentorship right now is still in like its development but in my own life i've seen how it's affected my way of like seeing stuff you're already helping folk even if you don't end up like i mean you're not not going to do it like i know this idea is amazing but being able to even hold into awareness that like the process of being in public making the big swings striving is helping people in all these invisible ways that aren't even directly connected to the thing. And that's the real power of the effective allyship is that, you know, someone like me sees your thing is like, that's tight. Okay. What am I going to like work on? Someone else sees, okay, that's amazing. What am I going to work on? You might even inspire some rivals and they're like, let's take this dude's money, but that's still ultimately helping like the entire world. Um, and that's cool. Or maybe Niantic this time goes, Oh man, this dude keeps like rolling up. We either got to like hook him up or we got to actually like, <laughs> spoon yeah, stop him what the answer is, you know, or do something about it like he clearly is is trying and so there, there's a lot a social component to effective allyship that's also just like modeling the behaviors the reason I, I delve into this so deeply in the podcast is just it's it's the outer world but it's also the inner world and right now like it feels like we're in a world that's bereft of joyful players and effective heroes and so a lot of like again my framework is just like yo how do you create your character such that it's an interesting story to watch and how do you develop your player self so that you're playing a game that's fun to play? And then how do you change the environment such that you can't lose? The thing I love about the rejection game is that that's the first time that you start doing dungeon master stuff where it's like, do what you want. I can't lose. If I get rejected, I win. If I get the thing, I win. And it's when you start creating those win-win scenarios that you really become unstoppable and that the showing up, which is the last stage, showing up is just, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's showing up. It's getting enough awareness of the world enough bravery enough growth so that whatever comes your way you can sort of handle um, and again keeps you in the game and keeps you moving forward so that's that's amazing um so yeah that's that's the whole rundown i guess what i'm curious about now is how do people get involved let's say someone's listening to the show and they're like oh mentorship is super tight i want it i went in what type of allies are you looking for in helping you be allies to people and what kind of people again are you trying to help like today like how can people get the people who you're able to help in front of you as fast as possible well number one is um again mentorship in the name it says mentors where they chip in uh we were trying to reach community members community organizations um neighbors to students and parents who might not be able to directly affect their student but could affect another neighboring student uh, with their passion and their desire and their academic uh, pursuits or their goal and career that they're in. Uh, so the groups of people, mentors, organizations, neighbors, community uh, leaders, um, especially those who have organizations that are directly involved with students uh, age or sixth grade through 12th grade or even into college, uh, because what we want to do is be able to facilitate a broad range of scholarship opportunities that go beyond just hey are you a junior or senior in high school are you uh because if you are then you're eligible no we want to be able to make more students eligible for scholarships just by saying yeah even if you're in sixth grade you can apply to this scholarship well most then people then say well what happens to the money how do i get the money well we've got technology these days where we can later build in that digital wallet. But as I mentioned before, right now, we've got the gift cards that we can directly send to those students. And we can keep a ledger uh, that shows which students need to be awarded what and at what times, or if they wanted to have their scholarship dispersed to them immediately. So having that financial component kind of helps to quell, well, what happens to the scholarship money that I earned back in sixth grade? Well, trust me, we're keeping a solid ledger of that. We're using blockchain technology. Uh, that is the new frontier in financial transactions. Um, and we're making it such that that becomes almost essential. Like it will be like Visa, MasterCard, American Express. When you go to college, they're gonna say, hey, do you have your mentorship card? Because that's how you can pay for your tuition. Oh, did you spend the last seven years from sixth through 12th grade 
earning and accumulating scholarship funds, cool, come on to our college. We, we want to teach you, we want to educate you, we want to help you follow your passion. But of course we want that money. So <laughs> bring that mentorship money on over here to our school. Um, because those are the types of students that we're trying to affect. And to any sponsors out there with small businesses and uh, large corporations and companies, uh, we want to advertise your scholarship. If you already have a scholarship that you have on your website, I guarantee it's probably obscure. It's probably hard for students to find, and it may not even be reaching the target audiences that you're looking for. But through mentorship, we kind of help eliminate those distractions where students would normally find when going to www.letmesearchforscholarship.com or <laughs> going through Instagram and seeing all the posts that's, oh, there's a scholarship. But then right after it is, oh, let me get distracted by that. Oh, yeah, I'm going to stay on that for an hour. Oh, I was supposed to just go apply to that scholarship. We're trying to create that environment where education and academic pursuit and scholarship is kind of a tunnel vision and tunnel focus for those uh, that are looking to apply and find those scholarships. Uh, and I think the last part of the question was the people. I, and I may have already touched on that, just the type of people. Yeah, or even, yeah, like, so you you hit the mentors, you hit the, like the scholarship havers, but also like how they get involved. Like this is a project that's still in development. How do people get involved uh, helping you actually bring it to market and stuff? www.mentorschip, that's mentorschip.com. Uh, we're redeveloping our website right now to make it more uh, digestible, have just very simple selection options, whether you want to leave a scholarship, whether you want to discover a scholarship, uh, check out our website, see if, there, if you're a student, if there are scholarship opportunities that we already have, be it micro scholarship or macro scholarship that we're already advertising uh, on behalf of a community organization, a sponsor, or even a mentor. Uh, and for mentors, similarly, go to mentorship.com. And if you want to leave a scholarship for a student, it can be as, minimal, as little as $25 can turn into a micro scholarship for a student. And though you might not believe that that should be scholarship worthy, well, if you get $125 scholarships, you've got a pretty good penny to start college with, especially if you're going into an in-state school. You, that might cover almost your whole tuition for four years. But if you're going out of state, we want to encourage those students to keep applying. So keep putting more scholarships and generating more scholarships from those mentors and community organizations. Uh, that students can find, easily discover, apply to instantly, and be able to be awarded. Hell yeah. All right, Micah. It's been a total blast. Thank you for being a guest. And again, everybody, uh, this is it. I always fail to sign off appropriately, so I'm going to use my old school sign off thing. Spay new to your pets, everybody. <laughs> we'll see <laughs> you next time. Thank you, Wendell. Great being on your show. Appreciate everything. Hell yeah. And we are.